Hi, everyone. This is Rita Matuzic, and you are listening to the Real Talk, Real Results podcast, the show that doesn't sugarcoat B2B marketers' everyday challenges and discusses actionable, realistic solutions. Today, we're discussing account-based marketing and how to determine if your ABM strategy is too watered down. Joining me is Colby Wren, VP of Growth Marketing at Ambient AI. Colby, can you tell our audience a little bit about your background and expertise? I have uh, been blessed with a fantastic marketing background over my last decade of work. Uh, After stopping playing college baseball, I decided, you know what, what am I going to do with 40 extra hours in my week? So I started a digital marketing agency. So started there, worked my way into B2B tech sales, and then marketing kept calling my name. I went back into a demand gen role uh, over at Hortonworks, and then that transitioned into Cloudera. And then I went and ran demand generation and had the privilege of working with you uh, for almost four and a half years at Delphix. Uh, Now I'm at Ambient AI, and it's been a pleasure just starting to build up from the ground um, a new marketing function over here. So uh, yeah, that's basically my background. So I want to get into, you know, our discussion today on the topic of account-based marketing and how it's been on the rise for many years. It's definitely a core strategy of many enterprise organizations, B2B organizations. Um, And it's safe to say that it is the one of the, if not the most prominent strategy used by enterprise marketers and sellers. So Colby, what does ABM mean for you? Well, I think it still all goes back to the customers and prospects that you're trying to reach, right? I think often in ABM, we become selfish. We, we make the selection of the accounts we want. And we forget that roughly 95% of the accounts out there are not in an open buying cycle. So you really have to be selective. You have to be intentional. And you have to have really good data to prove why or why not you should select some of those accounts. So it definitely does start with the customer and then you have to find them where they are on their buyer's journey. So those are kind of the initial building blocks. From there, it's really about how many accounts can you actively manage? Do you have an, an average sales price that's worth the cost of admission of doing a very robust account based marketing program? You see a lot of really strong velocity SaaS sales organizations that they don't touch ABM, mainly because they can't afford to. If you're if you're swiping with a credit card, ABM can be very challenging because it can be Mm -hmm. very costly. Whereas if you're a large enterprise sale that has a longer sales cycle, ABM is perfect for you because not only can you accelerate the sales cycle, you can increase the ASP, and at the end of the day. It's really about that wall-to-wall entrenchment in any of your target accounts. So you know your buying centers, you know who's going to be your influencers and champions, and that integrated marketing approach uh, really does a great job uh, for that market. I want to get into on the topic of like getting ABM started and who's involved in that. I mean, a lot of people us included, you know, you typically focus on that relationship, that alignment between the sales organization and marketing, but what other teams outside of those two are involved in ABM or should be involved in ABM? It really depends if you're going primarily for a greenfield new logo focused program, or if you're also trying to cross sell upsell within your existing install base. So if you're within your existing install base, obviously sales is going to be on both sides, whether it's new logo or customer expansion. But when you really need to add customer success and some of your internal engineering team that has the information is on those customer expansion motions. Um, You really cannot um, get by without consulting them. Now on the new logo side and on the expansion side, you're going to have a lot of the same cast of characters. You're going to have product marketing and product giving you direction and content and messaging that can help not only guide these potential prospects down the buyer's journey, but inform them and enable your sales teams to go after them. Because at the end of the day, ABM is not just a couple shiny display ads and targeted LinkedIn programs. You really have to have that full funnel experience from the top to the bottom. 
And on top of that, once you've run all these sexy programs, you have to have something to show for it at the end of the day. And that's really where the inside sales and sales development arm comes in, because without them, you are increasing awareness, you are increasing engagement, but if there are no meetings and opportunities being generated from that, then it's very challenging to have something quantifiable at the end of the day. I absolutely agree. I have said many times in our work together and, you know, other work and other podcasts that we've done that the SDRs are really vital to the success of any marketing program, the marketing organization as a whole. And I know you mentioned just now that, you know, we can't show results without the SDRs. Like we have to book meetings, we have to book pipeline. Um, but in addition to that, like where can SDRs fit into running ABM programs? There's this, this old talk about really account-based sell, sale of selling, right? Pretty straightforward. Everyone gets 25 to 50 accounts and people go hunt. A lot of people call that account-based marketing. It's not. It's just targeted prospecting. That's great. Everyone should be doing that. But you can't just put a shiny title on something and try to rebrand it, which I think a lot of people have done. Um, but at the same time, it's just like without, with just display ads or with just targeted field marketing events, you're still sitting there without a completely integrated process. And so in my mind, where the SDRs always come in is right after that digital air cover has run its course, that top level awareness that started, and you're starting to get those levels of engagement and awareness. Because if you don't have any of those things, guess what you're doing? You're simply cold prospecting. And that's great. Inside sales should be good at cold prospecting. But it's our job to help open those doors and warm up the people that they should be targeting within each of those buying centers and influence areas. How do you think that these teams can work better together to achieve success? Like not just, you know, marketing and sales, but marketing sales and other cross-functional teams within the organization when we're running ABM plays and ABM motions and we want to see real actionable results. Well, and I think that's what it comes down to, Rita. If you don't have buy-in, it's really challenging to run account-based marketing the right way. Right. Um, I'm blessed to have been working with some great sales leaders that when we come and bring a plan to them, not only are they excited, they want to drive that down underneath them to help it become successful. Um, but at the same time, there has to be mutual respect. When they come and bring me 100 accounts or 250 accounts they want to target, if there's no intent signals, if there's no engagement, and they're simply just a wish list of accounts, that's great. We can go after them. But I think there has to be that level of trust and partnership where I can take that push and just say, well, what about we, if we focus on these 50 that are actually engaged? There's people that have actually heard of us. They have downloaded some of our assets. They're slowly starting that awareness journey. To me, that's where that partnership really comes in, where you can have a candid conversation and have that level of trust that, hey, if we want to be successful, sure. I could say yes to your 250 accounts that have never heard of us. Or we could start where we know that there's already awareness and then drive that even further and deeper down the funnel. And I want to get into the difference between running ABM to 50 accounts and ABM to 250 accounts or ABM to five accounts. And also what are the budget constraints or the kind of budget to run these different types of ABM programs, like one to few, one to one, one to many? Sure. Well, again, that goes primarily back to your ASP. If you have a large ASP and you have significant ARR, you're going to have some cash in your pocket to really make a long-term investment into an always-on account-based marketing approach. And that's where most companies aren't at today. Um, if you're below 50 million ARR, it's it's pretty challenging to have the budget um, to do that long-term initially. Mm -hmm. But let's get into each of them specifically. Now, I always think less is more when it comes to account-based marketing. You can get more touches as long as you have good content that you trust, that you know can convert, then serving it to a small list of accounts and getting that like wall-to-wall -wall entrenchment is where you want to start. Um, but it doesn't just stop there. 
if I have five accounts I want to go after, depending on what organization you're in and the size of your deals, you could spend thirty to fifty thousand dollars per account on just a very, very intricate one-to-one -one approach for your five marquee strategic accounts. You really could. And nobody would be upset about it because guess what? Those are accounts that if you get into, they become your lighthouse, right? They become one of your strategics that you know, if we get them, this is a, it's a monster deal. Everyone wants to hunt those. But you need to have the investment and the patience to do it effectively. When you're doing one-to-one, -one, it's less about just like a generalized message. It's really about creating something that can hook them, that's relevant to them. Like we hear about personalization all the time in sales development and marketing. Personalization is great. Personalization gets your attention. But if the meat at the end of that isn't relevant, then who the hell cares? Right. right? Like personalization without relevant content is just that. It's an eye grabber that goes nowhere. So having that very tight, focused, relevant message um, is critical. Now, as we take a step back and we dive into kind of one to few, which is more of like 50-ish accounts, that's where it's probably better to start out, depending on your maturity in account-based marketing, to go to a verticalized play, right? You know you have customers, hopefully from a wide swath of, verticals, but you always know there's one that you've done really well in. You have a repeatable process there. You understand the pains there. And not only that, you hope that you have a few reference customers that you can leverage um, within that buyer's journey for that third party right. validation that, that sells way more than any of your people can internally. And so when you go for that one to few, the verticalized approach is probably the strongest um, because you know the pains, you can go down that path, and you have referenceability. Uh, the budget there is very similar to one-to-one. -to -one. It's just spread out across a lot less touches, um, but a much longer time frame. You can't really run a one-to-few over a 90-day period, right? right? Like by the time you set it up, by the time you have the top level awareness and top level engagement, this needs to be a 120 to 180 day sprint at the minimum before you can feel confident in anything um, coming from it. Because again, it's going to be, hopefully you're doing intent, engagement, and then you're factoring that all in. But if you're attacking 50 accounts without a massive budget, you're going to have to play the long game and do that very, very strategically. Again, still relevant content, still something that's pointed and hooked, but a little bit more focused on the individual vertical itself. Um, and then that finally brings us to one-to-many. One-to-many is what I would consider a standard always on. These are wish list accounts, more, more or less. They're very cold. They typically are unaware to low-level awareness with, of your product or your service. And this is where you do send those, that, that account wish list from your head of sales or your CRO because you want those accounts one day, right? They, they are dreams. That is an always on 12 month campaign that never ends. Um, I would stick less to vertical focus here and more to specific use case and pain that is um, relevant to everybody within that list. That's where it's a little less pointed, a little more broad brush stroke because you're focusing on 250 plus accounts at this point. Um, but at the same time, those are those cold accounts that your inside sales team is always going to be targeting throughout the year. So you know at that point, you're just trying to serve as much awareness and as much engagement so that when they do call them and they do pick up the phone, you say the name of your company and they go, oh, yeah, we've heard of you. Not the typical click, um, no thanks, I'm not buying what you're selling. You're still going to get plenty of that. Um, but it's really our job to warm those up um, and go from there. But I, Rita, I feel like I've been on my soapbox, so I'm going to shut up for tonight. No, no, I love, well, you're here to tell us what you think and share what you know <laughs> and guide us through our journey, um, us being B2B marketers. Um, and as a B2B marketer, as someone who's worked with you, as someone who hears this next question as a challenge for many teams, um, what are the right 
programs, the right channels to run one to few or one to one ABM campaigns? Sure, one to one. It's it's really the entire kitchen sink, um, sure. but it's tactful kitchen sink, right? Like you have strategic field marketing events in their neck of the woods. Like we've done some really cool like Porsche experiences or extreme racing where they get to go drive a, a sports car that they never would probably be able to get into. And those are cool. Those are exciting. It's, it's eye-opening and it's a very engaging event, right? Field marketing, awesome. Strategic white glove event. From there, it's really about that personalization. You can do dynamic ads that are basically company and prospect. And those things start getting eyeballs. They start noticing you together. It's not really about booking that meeting that day, but it's about getting those initial eyeballs and that first click and that engagement. Yeah. From there, you know, you, Google search is great, but Google search is high intent. You can't really tell what accounts are going to come through the funnel, right. but you know what they're going to be searching for. And that's really where LinkedIn and ad platforms like Terminus um, come in where you can have that targeting from a company level as well as a title and persona level. Some of those personas are gonna have significantly different roles and responsibilities. So you have to serve content to each of them where they are along that path. So I would say cumulatively, it's, it's strategic field marketing efforts. It's very targeted LinkedIn ads and display ads. And then on the back end, it is inside sales with very targeted, personalized, but relevant messaging uh, driving them to learn more. And so you blend all of those together. You throw a couple direct mail gifting boxes that are unique and creative for that persona and that company specifically. And you've got a really robust one-to-one -one program. Um, but yeah. again, you have to think about the end user more than you have to think about the selfish one of your organization. And I think that's sometimes I have to remind myself of that. Um, yes. of, hey, of course I want Coca-Cola and Bank of America, but do they need me? And if they do, let's make sure we make a good case for it. Yes. And I think that's where the role of messaging really comes into play. And you've mentioned a couple of times now, the importance of personalization, of serving the right content, depending on where somebody is at in their buyer's journey. Let's dig into that a little bit more. Like, how do you think about creating the right experience with the right messaging for different accounts and then different people at the different stages of engagement and the buyer's journey. Sure. I used to have a really cool diagram that basically showed that the higher in the organization somebody gets at an executive level, it's less about them personally and individually and more about what makes their team better, what makes their team more efficient, right? And then as you go lower on that totem pole, it's a lot more about individual experience. Is this a manual process that we can automate? Is this a process that we can make your life better? Shave three to four hours off of your daily um, tasks, right? And so learning where each of those personas and titles fits on that scale, it can, you really start digging into the messaging. Sometimes you're just on a fact-finding mission and you have to go to some of the lower level personas primarily just so that you can gather information because guess what? They're the ones doing the work. They're the ones in the trenches that have that experience. And then you take that fact-finding mission, you gather all of that information, and you work up the chain just another level. And then you go for those director manager level personas because guess what? They're the ones that are now managing all of those individuals. And then once you learn about their individual projects and the processes that they're trying to implement, you know that has been directed to them by the person right above them. And so as you get higher and higher on that chain, you realize that, okay, do I have enough information to make you know, a, val a valid case for you to try whatever I'm selling? And so at the end of the day, if you don't have some of that that information from your existing customer base to begin with, it's really hard to find that pointed message that hits to the pain to the individual and to the team. So yeah. finding both of those I think is critical um, because each of them has a different lever that makes them tick. That's right. And 
the selling emotions have become selling into a buying group versus selling into an individual. So you really have to be prepared with messaging, with um, advertisements, with the way that the sellers speak to who they're engaged with for all levels of individuals in that buying group, um, which can be very challenging. I want to switch gears a little bit and dig into something that keeps all of us up at night and makes our skin crawl a little bit. And you know where I'm going with this attribution. Yeah. Oh, wow. We're talking first touch, last touch, maybe a little multi blended. Well, we can talk about it all, right? And the question is, how should we be looking at attribution? You know, I think every organization looks at it differently. Right. But I think at the end of the day, attribution was created so that we could have some way to quantify the efforts that marketing and sales do, right? And so on one hand, you want to grab as much of the attribution as you can, but you also have to be realistic. Like if I look at an account history and it says, I've spoken to sales, I'm in stage three, I'm in stage five procurement, and then they're already closing this deal and then they go uh, get a demo request. Do I think I should get all the credit as, a, as the last touch for that demo request to pull them over the line? No, but I should be able to get some piece of the pie. And I think that's where the blended models are going, where it's a little bit more of a weighted average than a, it's only because of that last touch. Or maybe it's that field marketing event that they went to 13 years ago on the, the first got them in the CRM. Are we going to hang our hat that 13 years ago we knew this person was going to buy? No, of course not. Because at the end of the day, if somebody has met you or downloaded something in the last six months, I wouldn't even consider that still warm, right? I think 90 days is like a really good threshold for somebody remembering you and having that like warm touch. So I, I think it's hard to quantify. I think it really depends. But if you're not using a blended weighted average, it's really hard to just say one thing and one thing only yeah. led to revenue. Because the one, here's one thing I've learned about organizations. When sales is hitting their number, attribution is a lot less looked at than when sales is not hitting their number. And so it really goes into, you know, that investigation of, you know, can we quantify the ROI of this spend or that spend? And you hear a lot of it on LinkedIn right now about dark social, right? Like all these organic touches that they don't show up on Marketo. They don't show up on HubSpot. But guess what? It used to take 100, 150 touches to close deal. Now it takes over 1,000. So we know that people are getting bombarded with information. Right. They're getting bombarded by inside sales. And so this entire journey, I remember a, one of our accounts at Delphix, I won't say the account name, but it is one of the largest um, insurance providers in the North America. They had 2,500 touches a year. Like genuinely 2,500 touches a year. It is very challenging to do just last touch, first touch, hell, even multi-touch at that scale. But you also need to know what were some of the touches before an opportunity moved to a higher stage? What right. are some touches that accelerated a, a stage two or stage three into the paper process and beyond? And so I think those are the areas that I like to dig into, uh, less about like pure attribution and standing behind it with pride, but really digging into each of those touches and stages and seeing what helps move something faster? What helps get us to some contractual stage quicker? Um, and I think that's kind of where I dig into attribution from a stage gate perspective. I think it also helps cool. us determine where to make marketing investments, right? If we can see, and, and it depends on what we want to understand, right? If we can see, okay, these types of programs, these channels are bringing in leads that are likely to take second, third, fourth engagements that drive them to a meeting and potentially even an opportunity. Let's invest in those channels for lead generation. 
And then looking at the channels after that, that are driving those conversions that get us to meetings and then that drive those meetings to opportunities and then that drive opportunities to closed business. Um, and I think having that understanding is what helps us determine our investment strategy, but it is a lot of data to parse through and it's hard to find the right tools um, and, and get teams on board with looking at things in this way. There's a lot of, I think, change management around the definition of attribution and even the definition of what is a real engagement. So that is my next question. How would you define a real engagement? When ABM became super popular in the last decade, there were a lot of engagement platforms coming out, like the engages of the world, the terminus of the world. And really it was, you could build the filter however you wanted. You could make it so that you were 99% a part of every deal. If you just turned on the email filter and sent an email to somebody. Right. Um, but really it's like, what's actually that engagement? And in my mind, it's when someone raises their hand, right? or when someone is perusing your website, I think you should give people points for going to specific pages, right? Especially a high intent page. So right. really, it's really one of your like top converting assets. They may not have downloaded it, but you know, we're not gating as much as we were in the last three to five years, especially after the pandemic. Uh, we're really focused more on being able to have that experience where you're not hiding behind gates. This is the information. If you want to learn more, you're going to raise your hand and say something. So it's not all get demo requests. It's not all download white papers, but it's about having a, a realistic scoring model that takes everything into account, right? Like we know, we've had this conversation. I'm going to say content syndication today, Rita. Yes. Where is content syndication the highest intent content out there? No. Should it be scored a zero? Also no, right? right. Like there's some intent there right, from a sponsored content perspective. When you start looking at some of your internal assets, those should be scored significantly higher. When you see what from the attribution and from that budgeting allocation is converting and driving pipeline and revenue, that's when you should start scoring those significantly higher. Not because you, you think that they deserve more just because they're converting more, it's just why wouldn't you, right? There's a lot of content that we have people download and learn and have that education, and they're just not ready for that BDR call. They're not right. ready for that meeting. And, you know, I think we're seeing a lot more of that um, over the last handful of years where just because someone downloads a white paper doesn't necessarily mean they're ready to talk to sales. Um, they're still probably in that upper top of the funnel uh, learning more uh, about what you do. Right. So, yeah, I, I think that's kind of the area where a meaningful engagement to me is one that means they're actually ready to talk to sales. You also said something really interesting oh. about um, the types of like downloads that can happen if, you know, you're downloading a white paper from a website. Does that actually mean you're ready to speak to an SDR, BDR, ADR? And that leads me to the question of what is your take on firmographic scoring? So not only do we score mm -hmm. on an engagement and activity, but oftentimes we layer on scoring for like target accounts, scoring for specific um, like job levels, um, other types of score scoring, depending on, you know, how your organization structures the lead scoring model. Do you think that's a good approach? Do you think it over inflates our MQLs or MSLs or whatever definition we're using internally? Are we putting too much in front of the sales development teams? So I, I think firmographic is a great place to start in your strategy. It's a great place to start in just overall targeting, right? Like if you're a software company and it's great for people to have Oracle EBS, it's probably great to know that data and have just a list of them to start with. But I think scoring them to a level where they would auto MQL without having any of these valuable engagement scores on top of them, I think that's the myth. I think Firmographics is a great place to start. But if Firmographics is auto MQLing you because somebody is at a higher level persona title and they come from an account that has a specific software, it's not a qualified lead. It's just a 
not a qualified account at that point. Right. right. Like we know they have what we need to be successful and help them be successful. Um, but at the same time, if they haven't done anything to prove that they're engaged or aware of you, it's just a false moniker. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Shifting gears again, but also kind of in line with attribution metrics results, how do we prove and show the success of ABM programs? I think the easiest one is always revenue. And then a lot of people realize that enterprise sales typically is not a three-month sales cycle or right. even a six. Um, you're typically talking about a nine to 12-month cycle for a land deal. And then most people don't count that first deal, anything other than a new logo acquisition that they plan on expanding, right? So you're really talking about an 18 to 24 month true uh, production sales cycle to go from pilot to an expansion. So right. it's really hard to put a narrow lens on such a long-term strategy. So what I like to do is I like to take a percentage of the accounts. So let's say we're, we've done a one, two, few, and we're doing 50 accounts. Let's say we get meetings in 20% of those accounts. So we're getting 10 meetings and 10 unique accounts. Of that, maybe 50% of them convert into a qualified opportunity. And if that is 10 meetings that turn into five opportunities, and then you know your historical close rates, within five, are you going to convert at 20%? I don't know, maybe most people don't. So you have to really look at it through that lens of it's still a funnel. If we get 50 and then 10 and then five and then hopefully one or two, have you done your job? And I think that we definitely have because at the end of the day, account-based marketing is still about making companies aware of you. It's right. about getting that engagement and driving them deeper into not only your funnel, but in the understanding of what you do on a daily basis. So I, I think that's really how I look at it. Obviously revenue is, is the best thing to, to hold your hat on yes. or hang your hat on, pardon me. But if you don't have revenue, you still have to have some metrics that would show that you have produced engagement uh, within those accounts. For our final question, for our listeners, if they can take just one thing away from this discussion, like what's the best way to do ABM right? And start small. So many people have that 100 to 250 account wish list, and that's great. You should have that wish list. The wish lists are for inside sales to then go target. I think really starting small, where you know you're successful, where you know you have repeatability, and yeah. then scaling from there. Because I think, I mean, we've had a couple uh, ABM campaigns that we've loved and a couple that we are not so happy about. I can almost yeah. always show the ones that I'm not happy about have had 100 or more accounts, almost every single one of them. The ones where I've almost always found the most success is that customer cross-sell upsell with a smaller number of accounts, probably less than 25 or 50. Uh, the next most successful is in that like one to few in that small vertical campaign. I think starting small is the way to go. And then knowing that if you're doing a one to 200 or one to 250, it's slow and it's very slow. Um, but slow doesn't always mean bad, especially in marketing. So start small, know where, know where you're going, have repeatability where you're going and make sure that your ASP makes sense to run like a full, fully robust account-based marketing motion. And if it's not a high budget, at least slowly build that program to where you might not be able to spend twenty five to 50000 per account, right? When you're looking at a one to, uh, one to few, if you're not spending seventy five dollars to $100,000 on 25 or more accounts, think of it like this. If I spend $300 per account, will that actually do anything on LinkedIn retargeting ads? maybe over time, but yeah. you're not going to get the frequency that you really need to stay top of mind and really drive that awareness. So I think that's probably how I would think of it. And the one takeaway I'd give to everyone. Yes. Perfect. Th thank you so much, Colby. Um, this has been so wonderful. Thank you for joining us. And until next time. Until next time. Always a pleasure, Rita. 
Thanks for having me.